So I just want to go over what we're going to need for this course. I think uh, it's pretty well outlined in the syllabus, but just to make sure we know. Uh, first of all, textbook. How many of you guys already downloaded the textbook? Yeah. Anybody order a hard copy of it? or? Oh, okay. Pretty ambitious. Anybody order a color version? Oh my goodness! Okay, we, we really split. It's on sale, really. Oh no, kidding! What? Which site is that? Uh huh. No kidding. Okay. Where else can you print out 400 pages for 20 bucks, right? Okay. So textbook is open source, uh, which means that it, it's published over. Uh, it's published as an open source document. Uh, people make changes to it, update it. They submit changes to the group that actually manages it. Uh, it can be distributed freely for you guys. As far as you're concerned, the main thing is, is that it's free. Uh, what you're paying for when you uh, when you go onto Amazon or one of the other sites uh, to uh, get a, uh, is simply for the printing of the document. But if you actually want to use the uh, PDF uh, volume, uh, you don't have to pay for that at all. Okay, one of the things that we ask you to do is, and probably this group has already done that in the, uh, this uh, previously, is complete a course course in ethics in human research. There's a, an organization, it's called City Program. Uh, it's, the website is cityprogram.org, and it has about a five or six, uh, depending on how fast you read, it's going to be a three to six hour uh, a course, which is basically a written material that you'll read. After each section, you'll take a short quiz. you got to get 80%. You can keep taking it over and over again uh, if you have a problem with any of it. Uh, and then eventually, after you've gone through all the modules, you'll get a certificate that you can either uh, save as a PDF file or you can print out. So we ask you to do that because we're anticipating over your career at Hunter, it's likely in the courses you take in the future that you're going to be working with either uh, human subjects or with data that's been collected from human subjects. So you have to know how to handle that kind of stuff. Okay, so the hunt, uh, the Hunter, excuse me, I'm, the old place, uh, the School of Public Health uh, Internal Review Board is going to want to make sure that anybody that's going to be involved in this kind of work or this kind of research here or activity uh, uh, has taken a course like that. If you've taken it in the past, okay, and um, you may have taken it uh, in a different form, a, a, a microbiological form or, or a, 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 a psychological or behavioral uh, format, if you've taken it in the past in any form at all, if your certificate is more than a year old, but we're asking you to take it again, but not to take the full course. Just take the refresher so you have something that uh, uh, you've completed within the past year. How many of you guys have already completed uh, that course? Okay, yeah, great. So just upload it. I'll give you a spot on Blackboard where you can upload it, and you don't have to print a copy out. I'll just be able to check it off. They have it. Okay, so we ask you to do that. For those of you that haven't done it, I really suggest that you do it early uh, in the semester because – as we get to the end, I suspect you guys are taking other courses as well. So you don't want to get into a situation where you're working on projects and exams and it's the last couple of weeks of the semester and you're stuck with the six hours of like, you know, online reading and quizzes and stuff like that. So try and do it early and get it, get it out of the way, especially while things are not too busy. Um, um, when you go through the options on it, it change, you know, I've, 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 I have about like nine passwords on it because every time I log on, it keeps changing and I can't get back into the beginning of it again with the old, with the old, uh, log on, um, it keeps changing, but keep your eye open for a city, uh, for the institution put in city university of New York and for the selection of which particular, uh, course module you want to take. Uh, probably the one that's most appropriate would be graduate students in social or behavioral science. Okay, so if you don't see that exact terminology, do your best. Most of the time, I think it'll be fine. You'll be wind up taking the same modules. Yes. I'll tell you something that probably I shouldn't tell you, but if you finish the course and you don't have that eighty percent that you need to pass, it just lets you retake modules. Yeah. Everyone. So yeah. it is possible to do it faster than that if you're kind of. Yeah. You don't even half the time you don't even have to read the modules, but that's the whole other thing. But it's really it's really interesting uh, information. So um, so as far as uh, technology is concerned, um, you're probably going to want to have Microsoft Office like Excel and Word, so that you can submit homework and documents and so on and so forth. And we're going to be doing some calculations with Excel. 
If you have a different form of word processor or a spreadsheet program, chances are it'll work for most of what we're going to be doing. Uh, there are a couple of free versions that are mentioned there, but uh, for the most part, people you know manage to find ways to get hold of Excel and Word. Uh, you need access to Blackboard. Everybody here have access to Blackboard now. Are you still somebody uh, still having issues with that? Everybody's on Blackboard. Oh, one more, one person. Are you like a late registration or? Oh, I have. I'm, I'm having a little bit of a problem with that also myself. Okay, so I, I presumably you were getting worked that that worked out with the help desk or with ICE. I uh, with the help desk. Oh yeah. Got helping you out with that because it's important you get the blackboard. You guys should uh, show, number one check uh, uh, check the announcements on Blackboard periodically, maybe every couple of days or so. Make sure that there's no changes in uh, schedule or. Uh, information about the course and also check to make sure that the email that you have for uh, 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 on your blackboard site under your personal information is something that you check on a regular basis and if it isn't you can change it to something that will forward to somewhere where you can check it regularly okay now statistical software we just talked about that uh, as far as SPS is concerned we have three options Three basic options for what we might be interested in here uh, on SPSS. I'll start with the actual buying of the software. Uh, there's two basic versions that you can purchase that will be more than adequate for what we're going to be doing. One is called the base version. It costs about $40, $45 for a six-month license. You go to your IBM site. You download the software. They give you a license for it. and You, you run a little licensing program, and it will be working on your machine. Uh, there's another version called the Grad Pack version, which has a few more functions on it than the base version does. It's not much more. It's about $15, $20 more, but it has, among other things, linear regression and some other functions that are not the base version. In the past, um, we've just touched on linear regression at the end of the semester. We haven't had, asked students to actually uh, do analyses using linear regression, but given this group is a little bit advanced, I'm thinking maybe things might change there. But worst case, we might, we'll find some way around that so that you can get a chance to use it. The computers here in this building, any of the Hunter facilities, any of the uh, CUNY facilities, I, you know, I got to get out of calling this Hunter, you know, because we know that there's an issue there now. But uh, 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 any of the CUNY facilities have, uh, all of the computers have SAS, SPSS, and, and R on them. Um, so you can also use R if you want to. The other option that you have is, is that there is a new virtual desktop version of SPSS that's available to people that have a CUNY, CUNY first login. Okay, that'll require that you go online. I'll give you a link to it. You go online, you download a uh, software that'll allow you to run this virtual software, uh, and the software will actually run on servers here at Hunter, but you'll see the program running in a window on your computer. So it seems like it's running on your computer. I don't have a lot of faith in this. Uh, Levi feels a little bit better about it than I do. It you know, I, it works. Yeah. He, he gave it a try. It worked. But uh, 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 but one of the disadvantages of that is is that you'll only be able to run it when you have a connection to the Hunter servers. So you, you you have to be on. You have to have internet access. Not running on your computer. Yes. It's cute. It's cute to why. Yeah. Yeah. So. Um, and you know, but it, it, it has some advantages over using this and you know, you can save files and and save your work and, and then continue it on you know on later or on your own computer. So yeah. It has some advantages. Yeah. So I you know, I, I tend I, for forty bucks for a if for a six month license for a piece of software that costs eight hundred to a thousand dollars, I don't think that's you know, that's a, a bad deal. You know, but again, if you want to save the 40 bucks, this is a possible option. I already put something on uh, the discussion board uh, where uh, there's a forum on there where you can communicate your experience with whether or not you've successfully installed it and are using it successfully or if there's any glitches or bugs or something like that. So we can share that information. Similarly with the other software, if you have a problem with it, you know, let us know. We'll see if other people have had the same issue. Okay, so, okay, so that's my contact information. Um, I have a presumably have a, a School of Public Health email address uh, coming in pretty soon, so I'll give you both the email addresses, uh, so you'll be able to get in touch with them. 
Uh, I know I prefer if you put BIOS 611, the course number in the subject line, so it doesn't wind up in my spam folder and it gets, alerts me to the fact that it's, it's very hard for me to miss that if you put that in the subject line. I, I'll bet you that that'll work with Levi as well. Uh, so that might be a good thing to do. Okay, so basically my view of this course is no man left behind. You have a discussion forum there, people that are having issues, problems. Uh, you have a whole classroom of people that are uh, learning the same stuff, help each other out. If you have a, an issue with a homework or uh, something you don't understand in the class, post something on the forum, and hopefully some of your fellow students will wind up uh, interacting with you and maybe giving you some advice. And from my own experience, you really, you know, it's an advantage to both of you because the way you really learn something is when you have to explain it or teach it to someone else. And that'll really cement your knowledge on it. So it, it really helps out but both somebody that needs the help and someone that uh, is uh, providing the help. Okay, that's the discussion forum. It's, by the way, uh, I also created a forum on there that says, uh, uh, that's basically, who are you? And uh, it's a place where you can create a new thread, put your name on the subject line in a new thread, and tell us a little bit of your background, kind of like what we did in the uh, uh, beginning. And it'll also just cement the fact that you know how to get there and post uh, messages and create a thread and so on and so forth. Yes, back there. Question? Yes? I'm sorry. Oh, for IT. Okay, good. All right. Well, we already know the time. Uh, and the lab, I'm, we're sticking here. We're not going to 800, apparently. Okay. And four dates that we're going to be here. Uh, um, okay. And uh, the, the uh, <clears throat> Google Hangouts or YouTube uh, uh, video that uh, Levi has created on the lecture is available immediately as soon as the class is over. In fact, while the class is going on, uh, the lab, because I'm using uh, GoToMeeting, I do that because it's a little bit more, I find it to be a little bit more stable uh, in terms of running multiple pieces of software at the same time, uh, rather than just a, you know, like a PowerPoint or something like that. Um, uh, that takes a little bit of time for me to convert, and it's generally available within 24 hours after the lab is finished. Okay, both available on YouTube, by the way. Okay, so it, uh, typically it takes us within 24 to 48 hours. We'll, uh, be, uh, it will be responding to emails and so on and so forth. And uh, aside from that, um, 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 well, we'll be here doing this stuff, so if you want to come in, um, and you uh, have the time, even though this is a hybrid course, you're only required to be here four times. Uh, there may be some advantages for some of you that come in. Uh, uh, but as long as you're keeping up with the work, you'll, you'll have a better view of that as, as well. My experience is, is that over the next couple of weeks, we'll probably, you know, this group might get a few more people, but normal, normal, normal semesters, uh, we might get five or six people coming in over the next week or two, next couple of weeks, and then seven and then eight. And then the week before the exam, we'll have like everybody be packed in here like sardines again. Okay, so that's my experience with, with the way that kind of works out. Okay. Okay, so now just to give you kind of a, uh, I'm going to, uh, most of the time in the lab, we're going to be working through uh, uh, problems. We're going to be using software. We're going to be trying to figure out how to, uh, 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 go through exercises and problems, uh, uh, statistical ex exercises and problems to organize data, to display data in a way that uh, makes sense to people. Okay, so they can, they can understand it and read it. So let me see if, oh, up, 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 up. so, so uh, basically uh, my history in this has been, I started literally pencil and paper. Uh, there weren't many computers uh, besides mainframes that were available to do the kind of calculations we're doing now. That, when I took my first statistics course at Brooklyn Poly, Brooklyn Polytechnic, in 1967, 68, that's what I used in the classroom. It was an electronic mechanical ca calculator and add subtracts and so on and so forth. The version we had actually did uh, uh, squares as well. Uh, but if you didn't do that, use a slide rule for squares and square roots instead. Okay, so we actually use this stuff until uh, electronic calculators started to show up. Uh, but it was really a, a pay, pencil and paper game in those days. We actually you know, had to write everything out and do the calculations with whatever device we had to work with it. Uh, typically, we'd be working with ledger papers. And, and I, I bring up ledger papers because 
there's an they're analogous to spreadsheets. Uh, they're basically just small, big big pieces of paper with columns or rows on them, and so on and so forth. And basically, a computer spreadsheet is pretty much analogous to it. It's just a, a computerized version of that. The first successful, the first widely used uh, 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 computer spreadsheet was a program called VisiCalc. Anybody ever hear of VisiCalc in this room? Oh, jeez. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they, because you've taken this course before. That's why you've heard about it. But every, every, you notice how every semester has gotten less and less, and now it's zero. Like, VisiCalc, VisiCalc, I, 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 you know, to put it into perspective, let me see if I have the video that I want to play, if I can play it here. Let's see, let's see, let's see. Oh, here we go. See, we got sound. Let me turn the sound up here. Actually, I'm, I want the sound over here. Hmm. I wonder if I can get sound on there. Is there a uh, control for sound on here or just the screen? Oh, that's not my, yeah, that is the screen. Well, I'm not going to be able to get to that, I don't think. All right, I'm going to just kind of try and get this to play. It, was this working, I, Levi? What's that? Yeah, well, yeah, I don't think that's going to work here. Yeah, the only problem is, is that I'm not sure really the sound is coming through here anyway, because I'm broadcast, I'm on Wi-Fi, and then this is actually running separately. But I'm going to see if I can't get you to hear it here. Didn't this work before, Levi? Can we get this to make some noise? How's that work? Is there a? Uh... I think it's already on. Hear anything? No. Let me get a flashlight on here. Shed a little light on the subject. Okay. What's oh, here? It still, it still has a cross through it. Okay. No, it's still on. I'm muting it here. I must still have a mic on. Uh, yeah, I need the mic. Then. Uh, maybe oh, you I, want maybe the... I don't need that. Yeah, I want to play the audio through here. I want the audio. Oh, to I can there. mute the mic here. Okay, try now. Apple two set a new standard for personal. Okay, maybe you'll be able to hear this anyway. Right here. Where's the that yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, let's give it a try. Computers and show the. Yeah, we're gonna. Go oh yeah. That. Yeah, because I'm using the mic here to. This is producing the sound. That's amplifying the sound. It's gonna. So we're not gonna get around. It's not gonna work. Yeah, that can <laughs> work. Okay, okay, I'll try and play it so that you can kind of hear it from Unless my you computer. You can put it on this computer. No. Uh, yeah, forget it. We'll be here all night. Okay. I'll bring this up here. Maybe you'll be able to get most of it. The Apple II set a new standard for personal computers and showed there was some real money to be made. Rival companies popped up all over, but the market was still hobbyists. Guys with big beards who thought a good use for their computer was controlling a model train set. Loads in the actual program. But for microcomputers to be taken seriously, they had to start doing things that needed doing. Functions that were useful, not just for fun. Over 2,000 programs. The enthusiast market had its limits. To reach the rest of us, the Apple II needed what nerds call a killer application. Software that's so useful that people will buy computers just to run it. For the Apple II, this application was called VisiCalc. It came straight from the blackboards of the Harvard Business School. Invented by a graduate student, Dan Bricklin, with his programmer friend, Bob Frankston, VisiCalc was the first electronic spreadsheet. A spreadsheet is a tool for financial planning, bringing together for the first time the seduction of money with the power of microcomputing. Dan Bricklin's professor at Harvard showed how companies used a grid of numbers on a blackboard to work out profits and expenses. 
60 down here, and your profit would be this minus this, which gives you 40. And then, well, let's see, what's the sales growth? We'll say there's a 10% uh, a The trick to a spreadsheet is that all the values in the table are related to the others. And So changes in one year would ripple through the table, affecting prices and profits in subsequent years. So Students were asked to calculate how future profits would be affected by various business scenarios. It was called running the numbers, and they did it laboriously, by hand. Well, let's say your initial costs have a uh, hundred fixed costs at the beginning, so now you have a minus 20 is how much you make the first year. And then the second year you have a hundred, but your your variable, let's say, is, is 25. So now you're you're losing, what is it? Um, there's a pain in the neck, it wasn't very good at this time. 80, what? No, 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 no. no. Uh, we failed. We, we just lost minus minus fifteen, right? <laughs> and then eventually you're making money. What year do we make money? And you know, and how much does the cost of money? That's what running the numbers was. And because each value was linked to the others, five. one mistake you're could mean mistake. disaster. Blows all your numbers yeah, afterwards yeah, because you make all your calculations based on other numbers before them. If I had miscalculated, Dan, who had worked as a programmer, started daydreaming about how he could use a computer to replace the tedious hand calculations. I imagine that there was this magic blackboard that did like word processing does word wrapping. If you make a change to a word, it automatically pulls everything back. Well, why not recalculate the same way? So that if I changed my number, you know, I should have used 10% instead of 12%. Uh, I could just put it in and it would recalculate everything, go through it. You know, and that would be this, this, this idea of uh, electronic spreadsheet. Following a model that's common today, Dan Brickland designed the program, but got his friend Bob Frankston to write the actual computer code. After months of programming late at night, when computer time was cheaper, the Harvard Business School Blackboard came to life. Now we set this up, okay? Then we type a new value in. Okay, here I'm going to take that 100. I'm going to change it, right? And here, no, recalculate. Whoa! That saved right. me so much time. People who saw it and went and got it, and like an accountant, I remember showing it to one around here, and he started shaking and said, "That's what I do all week. I could do it in an hour. What I could do, you know, you know." And they would take their credit cards and shove them in your face. I meet these people now. They come up to me and say, "I got to tell you, you know, it's, uh, you changed my life. Changed my life. You made accounting fun." And you, you have to remember what it was like in those days. We didn't want. We did not use the word spreadsheet, because nobody knew what a spreadsheet was. I came up with the name Visible Calculator, or VisiCalc, because you might emphasize that aspect. VisiCalc hit the market in October 1979, selling for $100. Marv Goldschmidt sold the first copies from his computer store in Bedford, Massachusetts. After a slow start, VisiCalc took off. What it did in our society, it gave people who were obsessed with numbers whether they're in business or at home. How much am I worth today? What's my stock portfolio worth? How am I doing against budget on this project? It gave them the ability to play with scenarios and change it and say, well, what if I do this? So it put people, in a sense, in control of the thing that lots of people in our society feel is driving them, and that's numbers. The spreadsheet was every businessman's crystal ball. It answered all those what-if questions. What if I fire the engineering department? What if I invest $10 million in pantyhose futures? Look, I'll be rich in under a year and have slimmer thighs at the same time. The computer says so. The effect of the spreadsheet was enormous. Armed with an Apple II running visit count, a 24-year-old MBA with two pieces of dubious data could convince his corporate managers to allow him to loot the corporate pension fund and do a leverage fund. It was the perfect tool for the 80s, the me decade, when money was everything and greed was good. The money seemed limitless. Cash flow. The whiskey. Many fresh out of college, drawn here by the lure of big money. He made millions for himself and others selling junk bonds. Forecast or plan. A group that has been motivated by greed. and help you work fast. In five years, the PC had gone from a hobbyist toy to an engine that shaped the times we lived in. Thanks to VisiCalc, the Apple II made history. Everybody you talked to just seemed excited about talking about what we were doing. Up a bit. And uh, yeah, there was this huge media explosion, kind of like the internet is receiving today, of this is the...
But not all the PC pioneers made great fortunes. Dan Bricklin decided not to patent his spreadsheet idea. Though more than 100 million spreadsheets have been sold since 1979, Bricklin and Frankston haven't earned VisiCalc royalties in years. You know, looking back at how successful a lot of other people have been, it's kind of sad that we weren't as successful. It would be very nice to be gazillionaires, um, <laughs> but it can also understand that the, part of the reason was that that's not who we're trying to be. We're kids of the 60s, and what did you want to do? You wanted to make the world better, and you wanted to make your mark on the world and improve things, and we did it. So by the mark of what we would measure ourselves by, we're very successful. Yeah. So I just wanted to see that, but that's the kind of impact that these kind, this kind of software had on uh, uh, any kind of uh, 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 science that involved the analysis of large amounts, large amounts of numbers. Let me go back to, yes. Oh, take care. Okay. Oh, I gotta get past this slide now. Let's see. Okay, so at any rate, that's what we're, we're dealing with here. Of course, the spreadsheet, basically has only three three functions within each cell. And you do an enormous amount of work with that. You, you can, uh, uh, one function it has is to be a, uh, is to accept text, become a label. Another function it has is to accept a number, to store a number. Uh, could be money, could be decimal, uh, decimal values. Uh, and the third function is to actually uh, embed a formula or a calculation in it. We'll, of course, be working with that. Um, uh, some of these, in, in, in some of the other courses that we've been involved in, it's been tough to get everybody on board with uh, using uh, a spreadsheet for a, a lot of different kinds of calculations. The other kinds of software that we're likely to wind up with when you're dealing with large amounts of data, database programs. Um, we're not going to be working with them. The, the size of the uh, uh, data that we're, sizes of the uh, uh, files that we're going to be working with are pretty modest. Uh, but when you're dealing with enormous databases with enormous numbers of uh, subjects and uh, data in them, uh, database programs help you organize them and sort through them and uh, deal with a large quantity and numbers a bit better than, say, a spreadsheet might. Okay? In fact, one of, the, one of the measures that people use for determining uh, what you might define as these days as big data is it's too big to put into a spreadsheet. So then you have, have to, uh, other kinds of tools. And we've gone through, of course, some of the different kinds of uh, ways that we would organize data. Just one thing that I don't think I mentioned is, is that when we deal with populations versus samples, uh, our language changes a bit. Uh, when we're dealing with uh, statistics involving uh, populations, we refer to them as parameters. When we're dealing with samples, we refer to that as uh, statistics. <clears throat> and of course, if we're dealing with a mean for a population, we usually, or a standard deviation, we're using uh, Greek letters, mu and sigma, and when we're using uh, uh, defining uh, means and standard deviations for, uh, st for a statistic, we're using English letters. So if you see me, you see me use mu, I'm referring to a population mean. If you see me use x bar, or uh, Levi use x bar, we're referring to the mean of a uh, sample from a population. Okay, just a detail that like will help you out later on. Uh, of course, a big part of what we're going to be doing with this uh, with the software that we have is simply organizing and being able to display data and understand it. Okay, these uh, this is tables uh, uh, organized into frequency tables, uh, data organized into frequency tables, frequency tables. Uh, now, nominal data, as you saw before with Levi, um, uh, frequently, or you organize into bar charts. A bar chart is different than a histogram. Bar chart represents a frequency with different values of a nominal or categorical data. In this case, it happens to be hair color, and uh, uh, we have two redheads, two, 12 people with brown hair, and so on and so forth. So you can visualize what the distribution, what the numbers of people. Notice that they're separated because they're really two, they're really four separate categories. Okay. Um, uh, no, uh, this, on the other hand, is a histogram. Histograms are a bit different. They represent numerical data, and numerical data tends to be continuous. That's one of the um, uh, definitions we had before for scale or a numerical data that's continuous. And if we you look at this, you can see that these are heights in centimeters. A uh, person that's 149.5 centimeters would be in, in the green bar, 149.4 would be in the yellow bar, but it's continuous. There's going to be a place for each person there. So one of the ways to represent that 
is that they're actually, you know, butted up against each other. So you can visualize that they really represent kind of a, a, a classification uh, of uh, uh, continuous values or numerical values. Okay, uh, so what do we have here? Bar chart or histogram? Bar chart, right? Okay, what do we have here? Uh, birth weight of lambs. We have histogram, right? Okay, good. Okay, what about this? That's a whiskey bar chart, right? Candy bar chart. And of course, a sushi bar chart. That's as close as we get to humor and statistics. So if you're not laughing at this, I'm sorry. That's all I got. Okay, so now, and of course, there's the box plot that... Uh, that uh, uh, I believe I was referring to. And nice thing about box plots box is you can display them using SPSS or Excel. You can display that, you can display side by side box plots. So you can kind of examine relationships between the distributions of different uh, groups within the statistics that you have. The one on the left here, right here, uh, is a, uh, this isolated box, box plot. It's really that one that's on the end there. And you can see these the whiskers that he was referring to. Uh, one of the things you may notice that the whisker here is shorter than the whisker up here. He was referring to the uh, uh, the whisker being one and a half times the, uh, 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 the interquartile range. Uh, that's true when you have an outlier because uh, um, you, you have to decide where to put that since there's an outlier that's beyond what most of the values are. Uh, if there are no outliers, usually the whiskers are the minimum and maximum value. But once you get beyond one and a half times the uh, uh, interquartile range, uh, uh, you'll typically display that as an outlier. And the software will probably wait for you to decide whether or not you want to include that piece of data or if there's some reason for you to drop it. Uh, another kind of uh, plot that we'll frequently be using is uh, when we compare two forms of numerical data. For instance, this is the age of a husband and this is the age of a wife. And each one of these dots represents an individual subject. So this one, this person here, the x-axis for this represents the age of the husband, and the y-axis represents the age of the wife. And the idea here is that we can see that there's an association if we play it, uh, plot it as a what they call a scatter plot like this, with each dot representing an x and a y value. Of course, we know that there's always going to be like over here, going to be like one down here, right? You know, Donald Trump, you know, be over here in like a very young life or something. <laughs> so this is, must be made up data, right? There's always going to be a few in there. Okay, so uh, I just want to show you another quick video that can demonstrate the power of, uh, uh, of what you can do with graphics when you want to demonstrate uh, public health information. And let me see if I can't find that quickly. Next time we get together, I'm going to try and get the speakers to work out a little bit better. About 10 years ago, I took on the task to teach global development to Swedish undergraduate students. That was after having spent about 20 years together with African institutions studying hunger in Africa. So I was sort of expected to know a little about the world. And I started in our medical university, Karolinska Institute, an undergraduate course called Global Health. But when you get that opportunity, you get a little nervous. I thought these students coming to us actually have the highest grade you can get in Swedish college system. So I thought maybe they know everything I'm going to teach them about. So I did a pretest when they came. And one of the questions from which I learned a lot was this one. Which country has the highest child mortality of these five pairs? And I put them together so that in each pair of country, one has twice the child mortality of the other. And this means that um, it's much bigger the difference than the uncertainty of the data. I won't put you at a test here, but it's Turkey, which is highest there, Poland, Russia, Pakistan, and South Africa. And these were the results of the Swedish students. I did it, so I got a confidence interval, which was pretty narrow, and I got happy, of course. I had 1.8 right answer out of five possible. That means that there was a place for a professor of international health right, and for my course. Just guess but one light, 
late night when I was compiling the report, I really realized my discovery. I have shown that Swedish top students know statistically significantly less about the world than the chimpanzees. <laughs> because the chimpanzee would score half right. If I gave them two bananas with Sri Lanka and Turkey, they would be right, half of the cases. But the students are not that. The problem for me was not ignorance, it was preconceived ideas. I did also an unfa unethical study of the professors of the Karolinska Institute that hands out the Nobel Prize in medicine and they are on par with the chimpanzee there. <laughs> So this is where I realized that there was really a need to communicate because the data of what's happening in the world and the child health of every country is very well aware. So we did this software which displays it like this. Every bubble here is a country. Uh, this country over here is, um, uh, this is uh, China. And this is India. The size of the bubble is the population. And on this axis here, I put fertility rate. Because my students, what they said when they looked upon the world, and I asked them, what do you really think about the world? Huh? Well, I first discovered that the textbook was Tintin mainly. Huh? Tintin's and right. they said the world is still we and them. And we is Western world, and them is third world. And what do you mean with Western world? I said, well, that's long life in small family. And third world is short life in large family. So this is what I could display here. I put fertility rate here, number of children per woman, one, two, three, four, up to about eight children per woman. We have very good data since 1962, 1960 about, on the size of families in all countries. The error margin is narrow. Here I put life expectancy at birth, from 30 years in some countries up to about 70 years. And 1962, there was really a group of countries here that was industrialized countries, and they had small families and long lives. And these were the developing countries. They had large families and they had relatively short lives. Now, what has happened since 1962? We want to see the change. Are the students right? It's still two types of countries. Or have these developing countries got smaller families and they live here? Or have they got longer lives and live up there? Let's see, we start the world. And this is all UN statistics that has been available. Here we go. Can you see there? It's China, they're moving up against better health. They're improving there. Or the green Latin American countries they are moving towards smaller families. The yellow ones here are the Arabic countries, and they get larger families, but they no longer life, but not larger families. The Africans are the green down here. They still remain here. This is India. Indonesia is moving on pretty fast. And in the 80s here, you have Bangladesh still among the African countries there, but not Bangladesh. It's a miracle that happens in the 80s. The imams start to promote family planning, and they move up into that corner. And in 90s, we have the terrible HIV epidemic that takes down the life expectancy of the African countries and all the rest of the world knows, moves up into there. the corner where we have long lives and small family and we have a completely new world. Let me make a comparison directly so, between I mean, United States of America and Vietnam, these kind 1964. Of, uh, this kind of data. I mean, where else America could you had small families and long life. Vietnam probably had large families and short and lives. The, uh, and this uh, is the relationship between the uh, uh, fertility rate and the uh, 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 life expectancy in a manner like this. Well, we're not going to be able to uh, get too uh, adventurous with animations and stuff like that, but this pretty well communicates with some of the stuff that you can do to demonstrate, uh, to summarize very complex data uh, in, a, uh, in a simple way. So we're going to, tonight we're going to get a little bit of hands-on practice with Excel. Uh, we might take a quick look at SPSS. Um, and uh, we're, we're going to skip R for now. Uh, uh, but maybe um, if enough of you guys are using R, uh, maybe we'll spend a little bit more time supporting it. So okay, let me uh, get started with that. Okay, now, if you go to Blackboard, uh, the files that I'm going to use now are there under the lab section. So if you want to download them to the desktop on your computer and work along with me, you're welcome to do that. Uh, it's on Blackboard, yeah. I'm sorry, was there an issue logging on to Blackboard? Okay, or you can just watch me, right? It's the first class, no, no pressure. Um, 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 let's see. Okay, no, don't need that. Didn't want to do that. 
Let's see. Teams and exercises. Okay. How many of you guys use Excel regularly? Okay. How many of you guys don't use Excel regularly? We got a few, right? Okay. So any particular reason allergic to it or we just never had a use for it or something like that? Uh, I, do you have an issue using it? Uh, are you concerned about using it as a piece of software? Right? If you are, uh, it's really simple. It, once you uh, realize uh, uh, how it actually functions, it's really a simple pro. It's really a simple pro. It's really it's easy to use. So I'm, <coughs> I'm just going to demonstrate for you guys uh, the really most basic function of this thing. First of all, uh, we know most of us know that uh, any one of these cells is represented by its location on the spreadsheet, by its column and by its row. For instance, this cell over here is D5. This cell over here is C9. So we can identify a particular cell that's on any spreadsheet. Okay, so you can have one of three things in a, in a cell. You can have a label. Okay, a label is just text, like January, okay, or February. Okay, you can have a number, right? The number can be a, uh, 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 it can be money, it can be uh, um, uh, blood pressure, uh, it can be a, uh, a blood lead level um, in micrograms per deciliter, uh, 5.2, let's say 3.4, and so on and so forth. It can be a number of any, and there's a lot of different ways. It could be a date, right? A lot of different kinds of uh, numerical values that you can put in here. You can also um, put a function or a, uh, or a, uh, 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 a formula into these cells. Okay, and then cell, the formula you can put in can be a simple arithmetic formula. I can say equals, and that's the way Excel recognizes that you're about to put a formula into the uh, program. Uh, once you put an equal sign in, things change. Uh, if you keep an eye on up here, by that little f of x, that function uh, symbol, okay, as soon as I hit an equal sign, you'll see a change up there. And there, it changed, and it's waiting for me to input the actual function I'm going to put in there. For the time being, I'm just going to add a couple of numbers together, 23 plus 34, okay? Or it can just be equals 45 times uh, uh, 43. Uh, so you can actually do an arithmetic function in there, or you can delve into these functions that are already built into Excel. And I'm going to get into that very quickly into the next spreadsheet that I open up. Now, a lot of times you'll be able to do operations on side-by-side -side cells or on data that's spread around the, uh, the spreadsheet. So, for instance, if you're looking at an invoice or something like that, in this case, we have the number of items, we have the unit cost of the items, so we can actually say that the subtotal for the cost of this is going to be equal to what's in this cell. Now, the way I can do that is I can either put in 10 times asterisk for, t for times 11.2, or I can I just identify it by the cell location. So I can either say this is equal to uh, F3 times, okay, and it's going to be eight times uh, G3, but instead of typing it in, I can just click into it and it'll fill that in for me. I hit enter, it actually does the calculation. Well, now the calculation I'm going to do in the, in the cells below this are going to be the same as they are in this, in this cell. Since these cells are adjoining, it's very easy for me to just click in that cell, drag down, and tell Excel that I want to copy that formula down through this entire column, and I want that formula to self-adjust. So I'm, I'm actually multiplying each row, uh, uh, each, each value in each row by the other. Okay, so there's a couple of ways I can do that. One is, is that there's a little fill function over here on what uh, they call the ribbon in Excel. I'm going to click down on that, and I can say copy that down. And indeed, it copies that formula down. If I click in, you'll see that this one is F3 times G3. This one is F5 times G5. This one's F7 times G7, and so on and so forth. Another way I can do that is, now I'm going to do that, is I can click in there, drag down. I can go up to edit and say fill and choose down. And another way that I can do that's even simpler is I can click into this box, and then go over to, there's a little circle, it's kind of hard to see, that's in the, the lower right-hand corner of this box, and just hover over it until I get that little cross, click down and just drag down, and it'll know I want to copy that formula down like that. So a number of ways that I can do that. 
Okay, and if I want, I can then add up that entire column of numbers. And now I'm going to use functions, one of several hundred functions that's embedded into Excel. And that function is called sum. Now I can tell it, uh, I'm going to type in equals to sum of sum parentheses. And as soon as I hit parentheses, it starts to give me some hints on what it wants next. It wants the numbers that I want to add up together. So I can tell it now by typing in, I can tell it a uh, excuse me, H3 colon, colon, uh, H, and the last number is H7. So I want that range of numbers between H3 and H7, close parentheses, and it'll add it for me. Okay, another way I could do that, equals sum, and I can instead indicate to it by clicking into the first cell without lifting my finger up and dragging down, and it'll fill in those cell numbers for me, which is better because then I don't have to worry about a typo. And it does calculation. But of course, as we saw in the uh, in the uh, uh, video there, one of the real strengths of this is that if we've made a mistake and it's really a hundred count, it'll automatically update any any other calculations that we've done on that spreadsheet. So I just want to. So those of you, you know, I'm sure most of you, except for guys that have just literally have never used Excel before, have kind of been exposed to that. So that's really the basis of Excel. So if you haven't used it before. Um, that's literally as hard as it gets for most for most of what we're going to be doing. Um, I don't think we need to do that one. Okay, I just wanted to demonstrate to you one of the other things that you can do with Excel is is that you can create graphs. I'm going to make blow this up so we can see a little bit better. And uh, one of the keys to, to uh, uh, exploiting this uh, graphing function in Excel is to learn how to organize the data into tables so that. Uh, the titles are in the right place and so on and so forth. And the data is organized in a way so that you can just simply highlight the data. Uh, this data is the, the uh, header is location and mold spore count per cubic meter. Uh, notice ones, uh, they're both text. Okay, but the data below it is text and numbers. That's going to be a key for Excel. So, so what this is, is mold spore counts indoors and outdoors. And I can kind of see that things are higher outdoors, but it would be nice to be able to de demonstrate this graphically. So I'm going to highlight these two columns. I'm going to go up to the top here and change from the home ribbon to the chart ribbon. And I'm going to click on column, cluster charts. And there it is, just pops up a, a graph for me, even puts a title on the graph, creates a legend for me. Uh, I don't really need the legend because it's only one group, but it's that quick. Excuse me? Sure. Okay, and the trick here is getting the data organized correctly so when you uh, when you select so when you select the kind of chart that you want to make, that it does it correctly. I'm gonna highlight it, right? Then I'm gonna go over here to uh, first I went into the tab. With not home, not layout, went into the charts tab, went over here to columns. I think the version may be different. Oh, you okay. Oh, answer, you're using a PC, you're using a PC version. The yeah, the, the ribbons may be different on the PC versions or whatever uh, version this is. But so. Insert, insert in the charts section. Okay, there you go. First you have to highlight it? Uh, first you have to highlight it, yes. So it knows the area you want to work with. And you can do a lot of stuff with this. Okay, yeah, let's see. And let me see if I can't do something else here very quickly. I'm going to just take these indoor values and I'm going to go over here to chart. I'm going to go to pie chart and create a pie chart. Well, you know, which is pretty useless, but there it is. Right? Pie charts, we're not great fans of pie charts. They don't really communicate data that well. In fact, one of these was zero. That's why we only saw three sections there. Okay, so at any rate, you, so the, that, that's, there's a lot of utility in Excel for doing a lot of different kinds of work. And one of the great features of Excel is you can use it for almost anything. And you're constantly recording your information, the formulas that you're using and so on and so forth, which means you can go back and you can examine what you've done. You can see what formula in, you inputted. You can see what operation that you've done on the data. And you can see the raw data as well in case you have to correct it, okay? So, but it, you can use this for statistical analysis, for financial analysis, for uh, 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 investment analysis, for calculating mortgages, for um, uh, for you know, recording, uh, uh, analyzing, tr you know, golf games, whatever. Uh, the nice thing about this is it's general software that has an enormous number of applications. SPSS is the opposite. SPSS is what we call vertical software. 
It's really designed for a single application for doing statistics. And it's really good at doing statistics. In fact, in a lot of ways, it's more useful than Excel is. Uh, Excel has limited utility in uh, uh, doing a lot of sophisticated statistics where SPSS really is designed for that. So before we got, I also want to go on to one more Excel spreadsheet that I want to go through very quickly. And I don't want to use that one. I got a better one. Let's see. Let's see. Let's do this one. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Uh, this is a spreadsheet. Uh, this is a list of, <clears throat> this is a sample of 18 values. Could be blood pressures, I guess. Could be weights. Could be, it's not ages, I guess, right? That's unlikely, right? But, but it's a numerical variables. Uh, it's a numerical variable, and it's a sample from a population, and the sample size happens to be 18. There's 18 people here, okay? So in SPS, in statistics, one of the first things that we're interested in when we start to look at, num at uh, uh, numerical values in statistics is we want to get an idea of where the center of those values are and how variable those values are. So one of the first things I might be interested in is which one is the middle value here? In fact, I don't have it here. I'm going to type that in here, median. Where's the middle value? The median is actually the middle value. Uh, it's the value if you sorted them and you looked for the middle value, uh, the, the middle uh, most value, so the equal number of values above it and below it, that would be the median. Well, as you might suspect, there is built in to S to Excel a value a uh, uh, a function called median, and I'm going to highlight that. And now it's asking me for the numbers that are involved, and basically just wants me to point out to it that these are the 18 numbers involved, and it calculates the median. The median is equal to 100. I'm going to check that real quickly. Let's take a look at this. I'm going to paste this, I'll copy and paste this over here, except now I'm going to sort this data. And there's a few ways to do this. You can go up to the menus at the top. On my version right here, there's a little A to Z uh, symbol, and I can click on it. It sorts it. So there's 18 people here. If I count up nine people, I get up to 99. But there's nine other people here. There is no middle value. Anybody have an idea what we're going to do for the median with the no middle value? Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Average of, yeah. Average of the middle two. Yep. Average of the middle two, which is 99, 101. That's where we got our, our 100 from. Okay. So now I'm going to calculate the mean. The mean is the arithmetic average. Now, it doesn't have a function called mean, but it does have a function called average. So I'm going to ask it to calculate the average. Again, I'm using that this method to... Uh, 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 indicate the range of cells that are involved in, in finding the average. Hit enter, and the average happens to be 99.94. I'm going to I'm going to highlight the other thing. The other thing I can do with Excel is I can highlight these various boxes, and I can tell it format cells. I'm going to tell it to format these numerical values so it's only one decimal place, just to make it a little bit easier to read this. Okay, so there we are, 99.9. The mean and the median are pretty close to one another. That isn't always the case. When we get into the uh, analysis of statistics, start talking about normal distribution, that may not be the case all the time. So I'm going to go through this. I'm going to go through this uh, analysis of descriptive statistics one time because I'm guessing you haven't done this, even if you've taken statistics, you haven't actually done this in at least 30 years. Okay, for a lot of you guys. Or you may never have actually done this and just relied on the calculators to give it to you. Okay, so so I want to know, I know where the middle is roughly. I got a median and the mean. I know roughly where the middle of this sample is and presumably the population that it represents. Okay, so now I want to get an idea of the variability. Well, what are the ways I'm going to get an idea of the variability? Well, one way is, is that I can say to myself, you know, I know the mean, the middle, the mean is 90, 99.9. I'm going to put this over here by X bar. Remember, X bar represents the mean equals, and I'm going to tell it's equal to what's in that cell. Okay, 99. So I'm going to copy this down because what I want to do is I want to see the difference between the mean and each one of these values. If, the, if this has a lot, if these values have a lot of variability, I'm going to see big differences between the mean and each value. If they're tightly 
packed together, I'm going to see small differences. So I'm going to just get this second column so I can easily subtract them and get the difference between the mean and each individual value. So I'm going to click in here and drag this down. And let's see. I got a problem there, right? What happened? It's, it, it started to step down. In other words, the first value was B21. The next value said, oh, maybe he's trying to do a calculation row by row. Maybe B22, B23, B24. And all those other values are all zeros because they're empty rows. So I don't want, I want it to hold that value. So I'm going to show you guys that even you really sophisticated, smart guys that really know Excel, something that you might not know. There you go. Oh, man. Okay. I can't teach you guys anything. If you put in dollar signs in front of the B and dollar sign in front of the 21, that changes this from a relative reference where it will do that kind of adjustment for you to an absolute reference. When I copy it, it'll keep that value. It won't go row by row. Okay, so good. A lot of you guys know this trick already. Okay, so there we are. Okay, it's all 99s now. Okay, so I find the difference between each one of these values. Equals not x is equal to each. That value is that minus the mean. Okay, and that's what it's equal to. And I'm going to copy that all the way down as well for each one of these values. This this time I'm okay with a relative uh, uh, relative addressing because I wanted to do that. So now I'm going to take all of these differences and. I want to add them up so I can see how big the total differences are. Equals the sum of all of these differences. Anybody want to tell me what's going to happen when I do this? It should be obvious, right? What's going to happen when I add up all these differences? I get zero, right? Because what's the mean? That's what the average is, right? It's the, it's the arithmetic average is the geometric average of all these different values. So the negative numbers, the negatives and positives cancel each other out. So it's not useful for me to just add up the differences to get a measure of variability. So I need to I need these values to be positive numbers. Two things I can do there. I can just eliminate the minuses and just use absolute values. The other thing that I can do, because we're in statistics and nobody ever does anything simple in statistics, is I can square these numbers. Right? Squaring the numbers, negative number times a negative number becomes a positive number. So that's going to take care of our sign for us. Yes, did I see a hand there? Okay, and I'm going to copy this down. Oops. Okay. Need me to do that again? You guys okay with that? So what, can you just select and put arrow up too? Yeah. Uh, select and, yes, I could. Yeah. yeah I, I'm at a, I'm a, you know, habit. So, but that number is wrong, though. So uh, 0. 0.9, so 0. 0.9 is 0. 0.81, right. but it's round. No, it's actually not 0. 0.9. It's probably 0.9. Not, remember, you rounded it. It's probably 0.94, and then when you square it, it comes out rounded to 0.9 again. You understand know, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, because I'm because of the rounding. By the way, just so you know, Excel never loses the data, even though that's rounded. It's only rounded for display. The actual number, if you do a function with it, is still there to whatever precision that Excel originally calculated. Okay, so we could get that that we get that number back, and in fact, what you just saw now when it did the calculation, you got an unanticipated answer because you didn't see the real number, right? You only saw what was on the display. Uh, anytime you're working in statistics, especially, we're going to be we're going to be doing square roots of things, squaring them, doing all sorts of operations. Never, uh, never uh, 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 round until your your calculation is complete. Keep every decimal place until your calculation is done uh, for two reasons. One, we have software, so we don't have to worry about it. It's not any harder. Uh, and number two, because by squaring things and finding square roots, you multiply the error as you go along. So you can really start to throw yourself off. Okay, so at any rate, now I can add these things up. I can get the sum of all of these squared numbers, which represent the differences between the mean and the individual values. So now this number is the sum of the squares of the differences between the means and each individual values what, that we abbreviate by calling it the sum of squares. How many of you guys remember that, that term sum of squares? Oh, so not everybody, eh? Oh, good. Okay, I got you something new. 
that number is called the sum of squares. That's going to come up later on in the semester for many other calculations as well. So you can understand that this number is, if the variability between the mean and the individual values is smaller, this number winds up being smaller. If the variability in these numbers is bigger, this winds up being bigger. So that's really a measure of the variability. Now, the only thing is, is that it's 800, 892. It has no relationship to the actual numbers themselves. So let's take the average of it. We're going to take that number, okay, the sum of the squares, and divide it by 18, which is the number of people in the study, number of subjects, or the, uh, the size of the sample. Except in, in statistics, <clears throat> we're going to be dealing with something called the degrees of freedom. We don't have to worry about that right now, but typically in an analysis like this, the degrees of freedom is the sample size minus one. Instead of dividing by 18, for reasons that may or may not be clear later on in the semester, we're going to divide by 17 and minus one instead. Okay, take my word for it for the time being. So now we're down to 52. That's the average of the sum of squares. There's a special name for that. That's called the variance. I know you've heard that statistical. Uh, phrase before the, uh, the variance. Okay, so now the variance now is a better measure of what the average variability is for all those values. But now I still have a problem. It's still grossly larger, an order of magnitude larger than the real numbers that we're dealing with because it was squared. So now why don't we just take that value and find the square root of it? Okay, and as it happens, there's a function in Excel called square root SQ, SQRT. SQRT, parentheses, and just ask me to put the number in there. I'll put that number in there. Hit enter. And now I have a number 7.2, which is a measure of the variability of the sample that we have. And it's down in the range of the numbers that we are actually working with. That number, the square root of the variance, is the standard deviation. And we're going to be working with standard deviation until you're nauseous. Okay, that's going to be a very important function for us. But what do we know now? We know that that's how these functions, these important statistical functions, are derived. Right? It's not magic. Uh, when we actually do this stuff, if you want to know what standard deviation is, you don't have to do this. You can just type in equals standard deviation. What a surprise. There's a function in Excel for it. Parentheses. Just take all these numbers. right? And we should get the same answer as we got there. There's a function built into it. This, that, the object of this exercise was to just get you comfortable with doing this kind of calculation. And I'll give you another spread, another Excel uh, sheet with maybe 10 values or something like that. You could try it on your own. Maybe you want to do uh, all of this on your own again later on. Uh, so you can give a chance, you get a chance to play around with it. Now, um, how do I know where these, what these functions are? If I click on this F of X, it comes up with a uh, function generator or function editor where it actually lists all of these functions. I can actually type in here and search for individual functions. These functions are sorted by their application, <clears throat> arithmetic, financial, so on and so forth. And if I go down far enough, <clears throat> we get to these statistical functions. Let's see, here we go. Frequency, uh, uh, count. Count was actually counts just the number that are there. I think I have that there. Let me, let me use that one. So you can actually look these various functions up and get familiar with which ones are actually there. Do count. Count. C-U-N-T. Right? That's the guy from uh, Sesame Street, right? The count. Okay. Hit enter, and sure enough, does the same thing. Count is 18. Right? The number of uh, people there. Now, minimum. There is, in fact, a function equals minimum. Okay. Uh, equal min. And the smallest value happens to be 88. The largest value happens to be uh, 114. And the range is the maximum value minus the minimum value. So the range of these values is uh, 26. OK, so now what about the percentiles? What about the interquartile range? For that, I need the percentiles, right? So let's see. The 50th percentile is what? Yeah. The median, bingo, right? That's the 50th percentile. Half the values below it, half or above. That makes it the 50th percentile. The 75th percentile is equal to percentile. Right? There's no end to the little useful things that are in this program. Percentile, well, now it wants an array, and it wants something called K. 
we can actually go into the health function and the formula build is it will explain uh, that terminology to it. But basically it wants the list of numbers that we want a percentile of uh, and comma. It wants to know what the percentile is going to be 0.75. Okay. And I'm going to enter 0.75 for 75, 75th percentile. It needs the decimal point. Okay. 75th percentile is 104. And the 25th percentile is, yes. Okay. I'll, I'll tell you in a minute. Let me tell you, 25th percentile is going to be that array, uh, comma, 0.25. And it's going to be 94. What this means is, is that the 75th percentile, 75% of these 18 values are less than 104, 25% or more. That makes it the 75th percentile. When you took the GREs, if you were on the, if you were the 88th percentile, that would mean 88% of the people that took it had a lower score than you, 12% of the people had a higher score than you, hence percentile. Okay. And the 25th percentile and 75th percentile are important to us because between these two are the middle 50% of the people that are represented in this sample. So what I'm going to find what that value is. It's going to be equal to 75, 75% percentile minus 25th percentile. Uh, it's 9.5, and that's the range for the middle 50% of the people. So we always kind of like to want to know where the middle is of all this stuff. Does that help? I, if I were to do it here, if I would do it here, the way I would do it is, this is this is the lower 50% is the bottom nine numbers, right? So the 25th percentile would be the middle of the bottom quarter, the middle of the bottom half. So it would be about 94. There's a dirty little secret here. You're going to get different numbers if you use Excel or SPSS for the for the uh, uh, percentiles or the quart quartiles, uh, interquartile range, uh, because they use a different, slightly different mechanism for calculating them. Um, uh, SPSS actually kind of develops a uses a standard deviation and a normal distribution to figure it out. Don't worry about that now. That'll maybe be clearer. But that's the idea. Is is that uh, we can use a formula to calculate it. The formula is equals percentile parentheses. And when I parentheses come up, it's asking me for the array. Give me the list of numbers you want me to find the, the 25th percentile or the 50th percentile. Right? Say that we want the middle of the 50th percentile of that list of numbers. It wants me to put in that list of numbers, comma. And since I want the 50th percentile or the middle, I put in 0 0.50 and close the parentheses, hit enter, and it gives me the median, right, the middle. Okay. So you guys can play around with this a bit on your own and get an idea of how this stuff works. Okay, so um, 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 let's see. Okay, good. Let's get this out of the way. Uh, what else did I want to show you here? Okay, so the next thing I want to show you is I'm going to take this same information. I'm going to save this. Yes. The air conditioning? I wish I knew I was freezing back there. Uh, that's a good question. I suspect that this is what they call it. Uh, there might be a control in there. If there isn't, there's, if there's a thermostat out here, you're out of luck because it's what they call a variable air volume system, then you won't be able to do it. But I suspect there must be something back there. Uh, worst case, worst case, put your books on top of it. Right? Is that a possibility back there? We only got, we only have about another 10, 15 minutes anyway, so uh, it, maybe you can stand up, jog a little bit. <laughs> okay, so now I'm going to open SPSS so you can see what SPSS looks like now. So this, this really is a get acquainted uh, 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 session for us. Get acquainted with Excel, get acquainted with Blackboard, get acquainted with various other things that we've been textbook, various other things we're going to be working with. Okay, so uh, SPSS tends to be a little bit slow, even uh, installed on my system, it's a bit slow. Okay, and when it finally comes up, it comes up like this. Comes up with a window, I can get this to, <clears throat> I can get this to go away just by clicking this box, not come up that way, just open a blank sheet. I'm gonna say cancel, just so I get a blank sheet. It opens up and it looks like, what does it look like? 
looks like Excel. It's nothing like Excel. You don't put any values, you don't put any formulas into these boxes ever. All this is is a grid where you can uh, uh, display your information, your variables, your data, and so on and so forth. So I'm going to go into File, Open, Data, and I am going to go and find the ex one, uh, a version of that Excel file that uh, we were just using. We go to Desktop. Okay, here's an SPSS version of it. What's that? It's on Blackboard. Yeah. Okay, all these files are on Blackboard uh, for in the session for this week. Okay, so now this, I, I already converted this file to an SPSS file, but I'm going to go in here. I'm going to tell it I want to find, I want to actually open an Excel file, import an Excel file into SPSS. And uh, right now it's only seen SPSS files because it says file of type .sav. That's a SPSS uh, data file. So I'm going to change that to show me the Excel files. And in fact, there are a number of Excel files. One of them I've labeled Excel to SPSS because the data is formatted. It's just a list of numbers is really what it is. Okay, that's an Excel file though. I can open this Excel file. SPSS will evaluate the data and it'll tell me that, uh, look, it looks like uh, there's data between A1 and A18. Sounds right, right? 18 values, right? And that's the only thing that's in there. Uh, it also has a little check mark there that says that read the first row, uh, 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 first row as data, or excuse me, read the first row of the data as the variable name. Now, I don't think I put the variable name on top. I think it's just a row the right thing. So I'm going to unclick that. If I don't unclick that, it's going to take the first number, make it a variable name, and then I'll only be working with 17 numbers. I hope I'm right. We'll see as soon as I open this up. And indeed, I think, indeed, I was right, right? Because 99 would have been up here in the variable name. Since it didn't have a variable name at the top of the column, and I unchecked that, it used its own variable name called a variable V1. Okay, so now what we have here is we have columns and rows. The columns each represent a variable. So this is happens to be V1. I'm going to go here. I'm going to go down to the bottom here. And there's a toggle down here between the data view and the variable view. Okay, the data view shows me the columns with the data in them, each column being a variable. Okay, the variable view shows me each variable. There's one row representing each column that has data in it. Okay, and what does it have up here? Well, it has the name of the variable. I'm going to change that to uh, BP for blood pressure. And I'm also going to put a label in here. I'm going to leave it numeric. I'm going to put a label in here that says uh, uh, subject blood pressure. Okay, and I'm going to check and it says uh, uh, I'm going to check here, and it says at the end here that's a scalar variable. SPSS only gives us the choice of scalar, ordinal, and nominal. And since it's a number, I'm choosing scalar. Okay, so now I've defined that variable. Okay, and, and now if I go back here, it'll show BP at the top there, which is the variable name. Variable name has some limitations. It has to start with a letter, uh, can only have letters and numbers in it, no special characters and no spaces. Variable names are not very useless for, useful for display and charts and graphs. So that's why when I was in the variable view, I also gave it a, a label. That label is what it will substitute for the variable name when it produces the data charts and the graphs and I'm so on sorry, and so forth. You, you used nominal or I used scalar. Okay. Why, because, why didn't you? But it's not, it's not nominal because oh, it's so not. A, I'm why, sorry. Why didn't you use nominal or did Ordinal is what, what ordinal is when you have categories, right. but the categories have some order. So in other words, for instance, a poor, yeah. fair, good, excellent, that's ordinal data, right? right. Because there's, there's a order. To, even though they're names, they're words, there's order to them. But we re also can't rely on them to be the same thing. There might be a small difference between fair and good and a big difference between good and excellent. Or in a pain scale. One person's eight might be different from another person's eight, right? So, so that's how we do it. But these are numbers, right? They're, they're uh, three-digit numbers. Okay, so I'm going to go in here, and I am going to do an analysis here. I'm going to say analyze, 
descriptive statistics. Okay, now there's a number of ways that I can do this. I'm going to go into something called Explore. Don't worry about that. We'll go through all of these menus during the course of the semester. I'm going to go into Explore, and I'm going to tell it that the variable I want to work with is the subject's blood pressure, BP. Okay, and I want it to calculate a bunch of statistics for me, and I also want it to do a couple of plots for me, uh, do a stem and leaf, do a histogram, so on and so forth, and should display that. I'm going to click OK, and it's going to run this analysis, and what does it give me? It gives me gives me the mean, the uh, confidence interval. Don't worry, we'll learn about that. The median, the variance, the standard deviation, the minimum, maximum, the range, the interquartile range, the skewness, the kurtosis, and so on and so forth. It produces a histogram for me. It produces something called a, uh, a, a stem and lead plot for me. It produces a box plot for me. Here's the maximum value, minimum value, the median, and so on and so forth. It did all that for me in about four keystrokes, right? We spent the previous 50 minutes doing the same thing that this, and not as much as this did in a few keystrokes. Why? Because this is designed to do exactly this. The downside is, is that you can really screw things up. It's so easy to do things. You can easy to do them wrong, like miss, uh, like uh, incorrectly identifying the data type would be a big problem, right? Or running the wrong kind of analysis. I'm sorry, there was a hand up here. Okay, sure. Okay, I'm going to go up to the top here. If you go up to the top menu there, there's a, there is a, uh, uh, something called Analyze. I'm going to go down to, these are descriptive statistics, mean, median, standard deviation. Descriptive statistics, I have a number of different options here. One is frequencies. Frequencies would be appropriate if we were using a nominal value, categorical and nominal, because it would produce, it would do frequency tables for us, which would be okay if we were dealing with that kind of data. Descriptives. We could have used descriptives here. I'm going to click that in there, and I'm going to click OK. And it will do the same analysis, but it will do much fewer of it. It will only give me the minimum, the maximum, the standard deviation. If I go up here to Analyze, Descriptive Statistics, and move down through here to Explore, Explore will give me more information. It will give me information uh, uh, on more statistics than I would have gotten into descriptive statistics. It'll also do additional plots for me, like histogram and so on and so forth. Okay, and uh, I have some other options. We're not going to part, talk about those for right now. And I'll click OK, and it actually does all those analysis for me. So analyze descriptive statistics, explore. I skipped the first two, the first one because it's re really more meant for categorical data. The second one I skipped was because I wanted more analyses, and the third one was Explore. The other thing that I can show you in an Explore, and I'll get to your question in a second. The other thing in Explore is you might have noticed that there's a second box here, right? If there was another variable, a categorical variable, like say gender, I could have moved gender into this box. Factor, what do we mean by factor? Factor, when we talk about numbers, means breaking numbers up, like if we have 12, Factor it is three times four, right? So we separate it into its elements. If I had moved gender into here, it would have produced two sets of data. It would have separated the males from the females and produced all those statistical uh, analyses and all those charts separately for males and females. Not only that, but it would have put, I'm sorry, I don't have a, a data set really quickly available, but it would have put this the two black spots for male and female right alongside of each other. So we would have been able to very easily distinguish whether the variability between males, uh, variabilities is greater for males or females, and where the middles are for males or females. Now, a couple of questions. Um, I just saw that when you first did it, some code popped up. Ah, yeah. If you, if good, you good catch. What that is, that is its syntax. It's now, like SAS and like R, uh, uh, SPSS has a language that you can code in. You can develop macros and programs. So if you're doing repetitive analysis, you can uh, develop these programs that you can input the data and, and do these repetitive analysis or accumulate data. You can also get to some functions that are not available in the drop menu, some more sophisticated functions or choices not available in the drop menu. Yeah, it's called syntax window, yeah. 
Yes, exactly right. You can write your own. And matter of fact, if you look at the one, the win, now the other thing you should know about Excel, uh, excuse me, SPSS, is that, uh, <clears throat> I didn't point this out yet, we got two minutes, is that, is that, let's see, is that we have a number of windows. This is our data window, right? And it's got two, two different flips, variable and data, right? The output went into a completely separate window. And included in that window <clears throat> happens to be the syntax for the operations that we actually did. So here, if we actually read this, you will see where it went to get the file, uh, what it did with it, uh, what the analyses it did, um, uh, plot, plot box, plot, stem, leaf, histogram, uh, compare groups. These would, if you actually copied this out, pasted it into a syntax window and said run, it would do the same analysis. Right, so you could actually see it's kind of a, a, a kind of a uh, history of the analysis that you've actually done. Uh, I remember a number of years ago there was a professor that used to use SPSS as a statistics class and used to annotate all of his uh, solutions with the syntax so that students would understand what was done, you know, what menu this route that he went through and so on and so forth. Okay, so hopefully this has been an introduction to the tools that we're going to use for the rest of the semester. Uh, when we started, I was kind of a little uh, trepidatious about the fact that you guys seem like a pretty sophisticated group. I hope that at least some of you got, most of you got at least something that was new. Okay, did I, everybody get something new that they hadn't done before, I hope? Yeah, okay, good. Okay, that's really the objective is, is, that, is, that, is that we get everybody learns the basics, but then maybe we throw in a few challenges if, if uh, you know, so we get, we don't get people bored. So let's turn the lights on and get out of here.